Carol, thank you so much. Good morning. Welcome to Baldwin Street Church, especially those of you who are visiting with us this morning, and also especially those of you who are worshiping with us online. I'd like to begin with just one personal uh, announcement, and that is to thank each and every one of you for all your prayers, for all your phone calls, for all the cards that you sent. Uh, I really appreciate it, and uh, it made me feel just warm inside and, uh, and, uh, and blessed inside to be the pastor of, of this church and the good people within it. The elders and I agreed to just a bit ago that after the service, I don't want to put anybody in a place where they feel they need to shake hands with me by any means, but I'm going to go all the way to the back glass doors, and I'll just stand back there. If you want to come back and say hi, that's great. If you want to wave at me, that's fine too. And if you want to stand far away and say, I ain't going to go anywhere near that guy, that's all right as well. But uh, thank you again uh, for your kindness to me and to my family over these last couple of weeks. Would you stand please for our call to worship? And we'll remain standing through the opening song, God's greeting and the song of praise. And our call to worship this morning comes from the 113th Psalm, these words. From the rising of the sun to its setting again, may the name of the Lord be praised. Our opening song, When Morning Gilds the Skies. And God who commanded the light to shine forth out of the darkness, may he now shine in your hearts on this day through Christ our Lord and our Savior. Amen. Ye servants of God, your master proclaim. We sing it.
It will be our joy and our privilege next Lord's Day morning to celebrate the Sacrament of Communion. And I invite you now uh, to uh, join me as we read the preparatory form for communion, Psalter Hymnal 976, but the words are there for you in your bulletin and on the screen. Reading together the preparatory form for communion and reading it responsibly. As we prepare to celebrate Holy Communion, let us remember that scripture calls us to examine ourselves before God. We are taught that eating and drinking unworthingly brings judgment upon ourselves. Let us therefore ask God for the proper spirit in which to celebrate the sacrament. Almighty God, before whom can be neither secret thought nor hidden deed, Grant us your spirit that we may know our hearts, our lives, and our inmost thoughts as you know them. Grant us your peace that we may repent sincerely of all of our sin. Find peace with you through our Lord Jesus Christ and grow in assurance of salvation in him. May the celebration of our Lord's infinite love in his redeeming death bring joy to us and glory to you. Brothers and sisters, let us first examine our faith. We all confess the truth of God as taught by the scripture and summarized in the creeds of the church. By this faith, we take to ourselves Christ and all his benefits, so that for us to live is Christ. Let us further examine our hope. All Christian hope rests upon the finished work of Christ as Savior. The Holy Gospel teaches that all our righteousness is in him and in him alone. God's children rely wholly upon the merits of Christ, find in him their strength and victory, and confidently expect his return in glory. They look forward to the celebrating of this Holy Supper anew with him in the kingdom. They will surely be received by God at his table. Let us also examine our love both for God and our neighbors. Remember the great and the first commandment to love the Lord our God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength. Let us consciously determine to live a life of loving sacrifice to him through Christ our Lord. Let us also search ourselves to determine whether we love our neighbors as Christ commands. Do we unselfishly live for the welfare of others? Do our lives reflect the godly virtues of obedience, fidelity, integrity, justice, humility, and contentment? Do we seek reconciliation with our neighbors in all cases of offense? If these marks of spiritual life are not evident in us, we may not presume to approach his table. Those, therefore, who live in self-righteousness, who hope in works or virtues of their own, or who do not show love to God and neighbor, have no true place at the Lord's Supper. Yet, we should not be deterred by any sin lingering within against our will. As we find faith, hope, and love within us, we ought gladly to obey our Lord's command and come with full expectation to God's open house of mercy.
Please remain seated as we sing uh, verses one and two of At the Cross. Before we come to the Lord in prayer this morning, I would just like to take a few moments and sort of uh, read through the announcements that I have before me because there are so many of them with some uh, updates. So uh, let's do that. Please uh, be in prayer for Ray and Marge Diemter. Both were hospitalized this past week due to complications from COVID. Ray is home, but Marge remains in the hospital and we need to continue to pray for them for health and strength. Jim Longstreet is recovering at home and we home and we give thanks to the Lord that he's doing well following his surgery. Gert Timmer fell as many of you know and hurt her back and we need to pray for healing as well as pain relief. And the uh, update on her is that she has been taken to Zeeland Hospital for further evaluations and tests. So please remember Gert in your prayers. Gord Van Singel, keep him in your prayers. He remains at home recuperating from COVID. And the update on Gord is that he has been placed under hospice care at home. So please remember him in your prayers. Also, Les Wallinga, who had a mild stroke. He's at Spectrum Blodgett undergoing intensive physical therapy to help strengthen his legs. He has uh, been moved to Blodgett Intensive physical therapy, so that has been updated as it states. Also, our sympathies to the families of Marion Kramer and Ruth Toonstra in their passings. We will be uh, honoring them at the end of the service, their home going at the end of the service. Also, Wednesday night, please remember 6 p.m. pizza with the polka rolls. Sign up today, and uh, if you know somebody who wants to sign up and is not here, let them know that they can call or sign up uh, with the secretary, with Glenda, and I think even maybe sign up online. So that would be a good thing. Remember that. And also, and uh, they're not gonna be happy with me after I make them do this, but I want Bernie and Marion Brookhouse to stand, please, right where you are. They're right back there. Bernie and Marion, stand up. She's shaking her head at me already. So. Ladies and gentlemen, family and friends of Baldwin Street Church, for 70 years, for 70 years, this good woman has been married to this man <laughs> who is a wonderful man, as you all know, a wonderful couple, came to us from Trinity CRC. Uh, we, have, uh, we have family uh, together with the Van Slykes and the, and the Brook Houses. My, uh, my middle son uh, married, uh, married their granddaughter and uh, we have grandchildren and great-grandchildren and we have been blessed to have uh, Bernie and Marion in our midst. And would you please uh, uh, give them a hand of congratulations. 70 years. God bless you both.
Thank you so much. Let's pray. Thank you, Lord, for this beautiful day that you've given. We thank you, Lord, for the opportunity we have this morning to pray for those who have been mentioned and to pray for uh, so many others that are on our minds and on our hearts. We thank you for family. We thank you for friends. We thank you for a, a loving congregation that in your grace and providence you have allowed us to be a part of. And we thank you, Lord, for the love that we have for, uh, for one another here at Baldwin Street Church. And we pray, Lord, from our hearts, your continued blessing upon us in the days ahead. These are difficult days in which we live. And we'll talk about some of those difficult days and difficult things going on in, in the life of our nation this morning yet. And we pray in advance, O oh God, for the uh, blessing of, of your word to us this morning as it's carried along by and through your Holy Spirit. Lots of folks from our congregation who need our prayers. But along with our prayers, a phone call, along with prayers and a phone call, perhaps a card or a letter. And we thank you, Lord, that this congregation does that and does that so well. Nobody, nobody is left out here at Baldwin Street Church. And if we ever hear of or find out that somebody has been, Lord, please forgive us and help us to uh, set that right. We have, uh, we have been blessed by your divine hand. And we pray, oh God, that you continue to bless us here in this place. So we look back at the history of our church here and we see your hand of blessing. We look back at the history of our families and we see your hand of blessing. 70 years of marriage for Bernie and Mary and your hand of blessing. We look back at our country and we see your hand of blessing. But Lord, as we look at our country currently and as we presume, and although we should never presume within the providence of God, but presuming is a human thing, a human emotion. As we presume that things might even get worse, might continue to get complicated. As we presume that there might be a continued falling away of the Christian faith within our nation, which was once known as just that, a Christian nation in the midst of our presumptions and in the midst of our realities, oh God, we pray for our country. We ask for your blessing upon it. We pray, oh God, that by the leading of your Holy Spirit, you will fill the hearts of your people, light on fire to the point of revival, the hearts of your people as never before, that America might once again know Christ love Christ, and live Christ. Thank you for this beautiful day that you've given. Thank you for not only having the opportunity to be in church on this day, but also to be with family and with friends and to enjoy the beauty of the outdoors and feel the warmth of the sun. Lord, we pray for all of those from our congregation who are away this summer for a time, who are on vacation, and those that will yet be going on vacation. We pray for them. We ask, O oh God, that you would give them traveling mercies, keep them safe. And when the summer finally in your plan and providence winds down and leads us into fall, we pray, O oh God, that we all might be back together again as a full congregation, worshiping Lord's Day after Lord's Day. Lord, we give you praise for the lives of Marion Kramer and Ruth Toonstra. 
And we thank you, Lord, that along with their families, we have the assurance of their destination. We know where they are. In regards to that, O oh God, your word is true. It is crisp, it is clear, and it is to the point. And to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord, to live as Christ, to die is gain. Lord, we pray for all of those uh, family and friends and neighbors and people that we know that are going through a very difficult time within family life, within relationships, within family life, uh, at work, our students, teachers. Lord, we pray for them all in these difficult times. And we ask upon each one your continued blessing. And now we pray, O oh God, that you would bless us as we gather around your word. Open our minds and our hearts to it. May your Holy Spirit settle upon each of us this morning and bless us through the word read and spoken. And we'll thank you for it. And we'll praise you for it as we ought to. In the precious and abiding name of Jesus, amen. And before we, um, we gather around God's word, which is indeed our bread of life, we stand to sing that great hymn, Break Thou the Bread of Life.
page 1121 or page 1211 of the Bibles before you from the New Testament uh, this morning, our text comes from 2 Corinthians 5, reading verses 11, 12, and 13. 1121 or 1211, 2 Corinthians 5, 11, 12, 13. Under the inspiration and by the power of the Holy Spirit, the Apostle Paul writes these words. Since then, we know what it is to fear the Lord. We try to persuade men. What we are is plain to God, and I hope it is also plain to your conscience. We are not trying to commend ourselves to you again, but are giving you an opportunity to take pride in us so that you can answer those who take pride in what is seen rather than in what is in the heart. If we're out of our mind, it's for the sake of God. If we are in our right mind, it is for you. The word of God to you and to me on this day. And may his name ever and always be praised. Amen. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for uh, this day that you've given. And we thank you for the opportunity that you now give us to spend a few moments in your word. We pray for the presence of your Holy Spirit in our midst. And we pray, O God, that uh, through that spirit, from pulpit to pew, we might be taught the truth of this scripture. We ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, as you've probably already noticed, the title of the message this morning is uh, a brand new ball game, a whole new ball game. Uh, A whole new ball game. In common everyday conversation, it most often means this. A situation that is completely different, completely different than one is used to or expecting. Let me see if I can illustrate that for you, ladies. Ladies, your husband arises early in the morning to meet his buddies for coffee at the restaurant and then play golf. That is his daily routine. However, on a particular day before he leaves, He first cleans the house. Then he fixes your breakfast. And then, while buttering your toast, he asks if you are in need of any extra cash for the day which lies ahead. Your responses, ladies, I suggest you at this point are three. One you immediately pinch yourself to see if you're dreaming. Two, you check to see if your husband, whom you've loved for so many years, has fallen and hit his head. Or three, you rejoice in, you rejoice in what must be some sort of turnaround. You rejoice in what just might be a whole new ball game in regard to your husband's desire to express his gratitude for all you do for him. Don't hold your breath. A whole new ball game. A brand new ball game. We've heard the expression time and time again in our lives. What it means, what it means is the arrival of a situation that is completely different. Completely different than what one is used to or otherwise expecting to happen or to come to pass. For young adults who have lived home with their parents their whole lives in the comfort and security of their parents' residence, leaving home and going away and living at college is a whole new ball game. For a young, married, otherwise independent husband and wife able to 
pick up and uh, go anywhere at any time for the evening, for an overnight getaway, for a couple of weeks of vacation. The arrival of a baby or two is a whole new ball game and a whole new world. For an older couple who have made the decision to retire, sometimes, sometimes you see that move as wonderful and relaxing as it can be, can be stressful at times. Many retired couples find out sooner rather than later that a fixed income can become a whole new ball game financially, and it isn't always easy to adjust or adapt to. In the year of our Lord, 2022, in the year of our Lord, 2022, in America, in the good old USA, in the land that we hold dear and love with all of our hearts, the traditional American family and home, the traditional aspects of American culture, the traditional aspects of American society, and the traditional beliefs of Christianity and the absolute truths of the scriptures as as the only rule of faith and practice in our lives has been and continues to be under attack as never before. And for you and I as older folks born in the 40s or the 50s or the 60s, for you and I as senior citizens, For you and I as senior citizen Christians, all of this crazy stuff, and I'll call it what it is, all of this crazy stuff going on around us is a whole new ball game. Yes, yes, a thousand times yes. We know that the Christian church has always been persecuted since its beginning, always has been, always will, till the Lord comes again in great glory. Yes, yes, a thousand times yes. We know that people of faith like ourselves have always been mocked, sneered at, called names, and poked fun of by the world. But no... No, no, a thousand times no. Is it ours to think, as we often do, that our day of persecution for our faith will never come to us and to our children because in so many ways, that day, I suggest to you, my dear friends, is already upon us and already in our midst. Seven months into the year of our Lord, 2022, And this world in which we're living is getting crazier by the day. This country that we cherish is changing in ways we never thought it would. Your life and my life in the good old USA is a whole new ballgame. Some say... And so many nowadays believe, who'd have ever thought it? That all won't be right and well in America again until abortion on demand is available to all women up until the moment of birth, who'd ever thought it in America? Some say and believe that all won't be well and all won't be right until any and all chosen pronouns are properly pronounced at the proper time, moment, situation, and circumstance. Things won't be right until, for example, and I just heard this one the other day, the word mom is replaced by birthing parent. And the word dad or father is replaced by non-birthing parent. And some say that all won't be right and well until freedom of speech has been toned down at the very least, squashed and canceled at the very most. These are not this preacher's words. These are words you've heard yourselves.
However, my friends, here is what we say. And here is what we believe. We say as Christians who believe in the sovereignty of Almighty God, we say and say without reservation that all will not be well and right in this world and in and or in this country until Christ is Lord in the hearts of all. Amen. May the Lord in and by and through his Holy Spirit shower his love and his grace and peace and truth upon our land and throughout the world. And may he do so soonest. Until then, in the midst of this whole new ball game, in which we live, our compass, our guide, our marching orders are before us this morning in our text from 1 Corinthians in chapter 5. In these days in which we live where everything seems to be changing before our eyes, You and I, as God's people, need to live, here's the key word, urgently. Urgently. For Christ. Our text this morning, 1 Corinthians 5, look at verse 11. The Apostle Paul writes, Since then we know, you and I, Since then, we know what it is to fear the Lord, you and I. We try to persuade men and women and children and neighbors and friends, my addition's there. Paul is saying to Christians then and Christians now, we must, you and I, every single solitary day, live biblically and urgently before everybody. In other words, live biblically and urgently, sound and true in all that we do. In these days in which we live where so much of what was once accepted morality and understood decency and respect for the things of the Lord, when so many of these things have long since been thrown out the window of modern day living, It is of the utmost importance, my dear friends, it is of the utmost importance that those of us who know Christ and those of us who love Christ and those of us who cherish his word with all of our hearts, his word that is the only rule of faith and practice for our lives. We must live with a sense of the urgency of the gospel in the midst of others, an urgency of the necessity of the heart of Christ lived by you and lived by me in the presence of all of those around us. Here's what I'm thinking. And I don't think it's just a wild idea by a preacher standing in a pulpit this Sunday morning. I'm thinking that barring a God-sent good old-fashioned national revival, barring a good old-fashioned national God-sent revival, which, by the way, you and I should be praying for every day, barring that revival, this nation in which we live is going to continue to hit the spiritual skids until... What comes along will come along, and that's nothing less than a divine reckoning. The time's now. The time is the current moment. The time is at hand. For you and I to live with a sense of urgency for the salvation of others. The time is now and the time is at hand. To pray.
pray with a sense of urgency for the salvation of others. And also to pray that God in his mercy and in his grace and in his love will withhold his hand of judgment upon this world and upon our nation for leaving the truths of the scripture aside. Before I move on to the second point, I, I just ask you as well as I ask myself in regards to verse 11, are you living urgently? Well, we often do. We say, well, I'm, I'm urgent about this, what's going, in my, going on in my family, and rightfully so. I'm, I'm urgent about uh, getting a new job, and, and rightfully so. And I'm urgent about uh, someday uh, getting married for some of the younger ones that are, 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 are listening. I want to get married and settle down. You say, I'm urgent for that to happen. And rightfully so in your youth to have that feeling. But above all that and beyond all that, are you and I living urgently with concern and Christian love for those who have yet to open their heart to Christ and know him as their Lord and Savior. <clears throat> look, at, uh, look at verse 12. Paul writes, we're not trying to commend ourselves to you again, but are giving you an opportunity to take pride in us so that you can answer those who take pride in what is seen rather than what is in the heart. In these days in which we live, we must always live urgently before others in Christ for the sake of their spiritual awakening to the necessity of their coming to Christ, for the sake of their salvation and all of eternity. That hangs in the balance. But let us also note in our text this morning that Paul stresses the necessity of you, and, of you and I not only living urgently before others, but living transparently as well. Beloved, Paul is saying here to his fellow Christians then in verse 12, exactly, exactly what he's saying to you and me this morning by and through the power of the Holy Spirit. He's just quite simply asking you and me this question, is your life, my life, an open book? Is your faith, is my faith, seen by others. And these days in which we live with Facebook and Twitter and emails and texts and videos on cell phones that can capture any of us anytime and anywhere, in the midst of this brand new ball game, where nothing can be hidden anymore, where everything is seen, we must, you and I, we must truly live, our, live out our faith publicly. Paul is saying to those in the Corinthians church, I'm your pastor, I'm your spiritual leader, and I want you to be proud of me and all of the leaders in the church. So I strive, Paul says, to live transparently. No secrets. No skeletons in my closet, says Paul. Husbands, is that how you live with your wife? No secrets. No surprises. Nothing hidden? Wives, is that how you live with your husbands? No secrets? No surprises? Nothing hidden? I heard a man a long time ago, and this just, just, just popped into my head. I heard a man a long time ago at a funeral home 
Uh, we were talking about the deceased, and it was a, a, a gentleman that had died, and we we're talking about the deceased and a good guy he was, and and uh, good family man he was, and this man was married, and his wife was still living, and we just got to talking about things, and he said to me, you know, I hope and pray that, uh, that when the day comes when uh, I'm the husband laying there and my wife is standing beside my casket, that nobody can come up to my wife and tell her something about me that she didn't already know. Husbands, is that how you live with your wife? No secrets, no surprises, nothing hidden. Wives, is that how you live with your husbands? No secrets, no surprises, nothing hidden. Enough said. Lastly, this. In these days in which we live, in these days that the Lord and his plan and providence has placed us, let us live urgently, let us live transparently, especially within marriage, and let us live without apology. From our text this morning, verse 13 of 2 Corinthians 5, Paul writes, this is, this is interesting. I, I have to admit that when I first read this portion, and I've read it before, it didn't make a lot of sense to me. It didn't register up here uh, and, until I looked in a commentary, and the commentary said, you know, read it in light of the book of Acts and, 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 and chapter 25, and I'll get to that in just a minute. And this is just an aside. When we're, uh, when we're studying the Bible, when we're reading the Bible, let us never presume that we know what it's talking about in all aspects of it as it's carried along by and through the Holy Spirit. And let us avail ourselves of, of, of commentaries and of other sorts of books that shed light that have been written by, by, uh, over the years by godly men and godly women to help us understand the truth of God's word. Paul writes, for if we are out of our mind, it, it is for God, and if, and if we are right in our mind, it is for you. You, you ever had anyone tell you you're crazy? <laughs> you ever had anyone tell you you're out of your mind? The apostle Paul did, as recording in the book of Acts, chapter 25, when he told the story of the love of the Lord Jesus and the resurrection of Jesus, when he told that story to Festus, the Roman governor of Judea, after listening to Paul's story and to Paul's going on and on about Christ and the blessings of his salvation, Festus said to Paul in Acts chapter 26, all of your learning, Paul, is causing you to go insane. And to this accusation, did the Apostle Paul ever once apologize for his faith? Never. These are crazy days in which we live, the likes of which none of us have ever seen before. This brand new ball game in which we participate in in the midst of it, may the Lord ever find us faithful and never, never, never apologizing for our faith. In the midst of it, may the Lord always find us true to his word. In the midst of these days, may we live always without apology, without apology about our faith, without apology of our love for the Lord, without apology of our love for his word, without apology of our love for his church, without apology of the joy of his salvation, and without apology of the security of the Lord's steadfast love, this side of glory that you and I are experience every, experiencing every moment we draw breath. And let us never live in apology, but always and ever in infinite praise for as long as we live, for the eternity that follows our earthly passing. 
as we find ourselves once and for all and forever in that place that I hath not seen nor ear heard nor the mind of man conceived of the glory that God has in store for you and for me and for all who love him. Shy away from that, never. Let that be your... Uh, Your banner call. Christ be praised. Amen. Father, we thank you for your word this morning. And we pray that you would uh, bless it to our hearts. These are difficult days in which we live. These are difficult days in which we find ourselves. Help us in the midst of them to live rightly and to never shy away, never shy away from any opportunity that we have. To share the love of Jesus and to speak of his salvation, so full and so free. And the power of the Almighty to lift up, bless and restore any nation, any nation at any time the power of the Almighty to lift up and to bless and to restore any nation that has fallen away from the truth of God and has found a heart and a desire to return to just that. We trust you, Lord, in all things and at all times and for all things and for all times we give you praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Stand to sing.
This past week, uh, our Lord in his grace and providence took two of our own home to glory. Marion Kramer at the age of 89, Ruth Toonstra at the age of 89 as well. Good, long lives that the Lord gave them and they lived them fully for the Lord. Jesus said, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. Jesus said in my Father's house, there are many mansions, and if that weren't so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, so that where I am, there you may be also. Translation, as we end our service this morning, where Marion and Ruth are now, we soon at some point will be the name of the Lord be praised. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord lift his countenance upon you and the Lord grant you his peace. God bless you. Amen.